Uh, welcome back to the second session. Uh, let me invite Professor Burgos Gill to continue his exposition on Arcular Theory, EQ Distribution, and Algebraic Dynamics. Okay, thank you very much. So today I want to present examples of this adelic theory that uh, I have introduced previously, and in particular to show how uh, <clears throat> this theory is very well suited to study polarized dynamical systems. So recall that I already introduced last day what is a polarized dynamical system. Okay, and it was, so what I need is first X, a projective variety defined over Q, then Q or a number field, <clears throat> then I need L, an ample line bundle, on X, then I need a map, an algebraic map, F from X to X, defined over Q. And lastly, I will need uh, <clears throat> isomorphism. Psi uh, is an isomorphism that goes from half upper star of L to some power. So X is a predictive variety, let's say of dimension D. Uh, to L tensor with N. And uh, yesterday we already saw that, in particular, this implies that the degree of F has to be equal to N to the power D. So the degree is very, very high. Now, uh, let's assume that I start with this situation. And then I can start putting a metric on my line bundle. So I can choose uh, X and L, a model of X and L over a step set. And I want to ask L to be relatively NEF. So it corresponds to a positive metric. And let's put uh, delta infinity, a smooth metric, a semi positive metric. M? No, no, this uh, phi, this has to be an isomorphism. So this is an isomorphism of the line matrix. Mm -hmm. And F is just a map that has degree n to the power. <clears throat> Then uh, I put a smooth semi-positive metric on, uh, on LC. And remember that this gives me some L bar, I will put some index one, that is just the line bundle L and then the family of norms, P comma one, for all places of Q where the, in the place of infinity, I just put this smooth metric, and in all other places, I just uh, uh, put uh, the metric induced for the model. So I start with any, uh, <coughs> with any uh, metric that is semi-positive and smooth. And now I can produce new metrics as follows. So I start with the metric one, is just the given metric. And then I define the metric uh, Bn. Then what I can do is to take the F upper star of the metric in a step n minus one. Now this will be a metric in L to the n. Then I take this isomorphism phi upper star to get a metric. So this will be a metric, okay, maybe. Let's write the isomorphism in the other direction. It will be easier. Or no. So I then take the, I transfer, using the isomorphism, I can transfer the metric in the pre-image of L to a metric in a power of L. And then I can take one over, well, let's say this is I, I minus one. This is one over L. 
And then this gives me a new metric on uh, the line bundle L. Okay. <clears throat> and now the theorem, the part A is that each Ln bar equal to L and these norms, um, B comma Li, B comma I, is a smooth semi-positive adelic, adelic uh, line bundle. So that this means that in every step, the norm will come from a model. In particular, <coughs> well, eh? what not? So I have so I have L one and I define L i for uh, from i minus one for all r. Eh? No, the L is fixed, the line bundle is fixed, and the metrics change. So I don't. Yes, so all of them are metrics on the same line bundle. So the line bundle is fixed, and what I have is a sequence of metrics on the line bundle. And the sequence U1 of metrics, the I converge to a metric, to an admissible metric. Okay. So <clears throat> the point is that I have to see that this is a uniform convergence. And then the part B is that for each, for each uh, B inside M of Q, the metric, so this uh, metric B is the only metric in L that satisfies that the mm -hmm. that this metric is fixed for this operation. So it's equal to F start of the metric to the power one over. So the idea is that I have an isomorphism of line bundles like this. Then I choose an arbitrary system of metrics that is semi-positive. Then I apply this iterative process. And then this iterative process converges. And of course, it will converge to a fixed point with respect to this system. So I have upgraded this isomorphism of line bundles to an isometry on its place. And I have constructed a metric that uh, satisfies this isometry. The point is that if I start with metrics that is a model metric and is smooth, nothing tells me that the limit will be smooth or will come from a model. So this is why I need these adelic uh, systems. Eh? Yes, yes, yes. So what I'm saying is that for each place, this metric, the metric that I obtain in this place, is the only metric in L, if you want, in the analytic vector bundle on the place B, that satisfies that this is not only an isomorphism of line bundles, but it is an isometry for all places. Eh? No, no, yes, yes, I do, I do. So this is for all places. Yes, yes, yes. So I, uh, the point is that I start with a smooth metric, and but I want to have an isometry on all places. So this process is for all places, finite or infinite. Okay. Well, now remember about the convergence. So the <coughs> I left as an exercise to check that it is really uh, at each step is a smooth and semi-positive. Just one remark is that the fact that if I start with a model metric, the, and I apply this process, I still have a model metric. For this, it's important uh, that when I define a model, it was not necessarily a model of L, but it was a model of some power of L. Because the problem is that what is very easy, if one has this 
thing is to construct models of powers of L, but not of L itself. So it's not possible to make a root of a model, but you can make a root of a. But I leave as an exercise to check this part. Now, what we need is to, <coughs> to check the conversions. And remember that the conversions, what we need is first that there exists an U inside a spec of set. And for every place in this U, the sequence has to be a constant. The I is constant. So this was the first condition to the conversions that in an open set, really there is no conversion. So it's a constant thing. But this is clear because the point is that I have my model F. Uh, so I have my model psi. And then since I have a map F that goes from X to X, this means that I have, I have a generic map from X to X. But then this implies that there exists an open set, there exists an U zero such that F extends to F twiddle from C restricted to U zero to C restricted to U zero. Okay. Now, uh, the point is that this isomorphism is only true on the uh, generic fiber, but after shrinking uh, u zero to u one, the isomorphism C extends to some isomorphism C twiddle from F up F twiddle up a start of the model L to uh, L tensor N. Just uh, looking at the equations and clear denominators, I will get a small place. But then, if you look at this condition, since I already have that these guys are isomorphic, this means that the metric that they induce will be the same. And this implies automatically that for all B inside this U1, the sequence I is constant. What, what? Yes, exactly. No, there is no end here. I start with the original model. So I start with the original model. Then the point is that if the original model satisfies this property, then I don't need to change the model. So then the metric at the stage two will be the same as the stage one, the metric at the stage three will be the same as the stage two and so on. So the point is that I already have the isomorphism, so nothing will change if I make this process. So this is why it is constant. And now I have to see what happens in other places. So I have to see what happens in the place at infinity or in the places that are not in U. So I need now to show the uniform conversions. And to this, I define a function. H will be the function one over N then C upper star of F upper star of log of the norm at the stage two and the norm at the stage one. So this H is just a, a function that measures how the metric will change in the first step. Okay. This is a continuous function. This is continuous in XB and in the analytic space XB. And this is a, a analytic space coming from a projective variety. In particular, it's compact, so it's bounded. And now, <clears throat> maybe I will put the, yeah. Now one can easily compute that log of the norm of a section S B in the stage I. This will be equal to log of the same norm S B at the step one plus then the sum from uh, <clears throat> k equal to zero up to i minus two of one over n uh, phi upper star f upper star of the function h. So once uh, I have that the difference between the function, the metric one and the metric two is given by h, it's very easy to check that then at, uh, I can compute the metric at the level i with this uh, series. So the metric at the stage one and then the sum 
for all these edges. But now, uh, from what I? From k equal to zero to i minus two of this to the power k. Uh, because the uh, the original metric is continuous, and if you make this process, it's very easy to see that if you start with something continuous, then what you will get will be always uh, again continuous. So then delta two is again a continuous metric, and when you have two continuous metric, the quotient of the two metrics is a well-defined function that is continuous. Yeah? What? Yes. On all the on all this uh, <clears throat> the Berkovich space. Okay, now the point is that if we look at this guy, so one of these terms, one over n phi upper star f upper star of the power k of h, this is just one over n to the k, and then uh, phi upper star f upper star uh, to the k of h. But now h is a bounded function. When you pull back a function, at most can be as big as the original function. So this is bounded by the supremum of H. And this is a geometric series that N is bigger than one, so this converges. So this series, this converges uh, absolutely and uniformly. Hence, uh, we get that our sequence of metrics converts uniformly to a limit finite. Is this clear? Hence, I get exactly uh, an adelic admissible metric because I get a metric that is the limit of a smooth semi positive matrix. And hence, it is an adelic one. So, this is the basic example of a metric where I can apply the theory. <coughs> okay, so, and then for the second part, uh, this is also is easy and I leave it as an exercise. So now what are the properties of this metric that I have introduced? So let's see some properties. So the first property, A, is that if I look at the height with respect to L bar, so L bar is this limit, matrix uh, bundle of the whole variety. This is a very interesting number. It's just zero. So the height of the total. Uh, is zero and in general for any cycle for any cycle uh, y of x then if i look at the direct image f lower star of y this will be a, again a cycle on y and i compute its height then this will be exactly equal to n times the height of y so when i take the image the height gets Multiply by n is the height with respect to this m. So L bar is the line bundle L with the limit matrix. So L, remember that I have said before that this matrix, this system of metrics, B i converges to a metric B, and then I define L bar as the L and this family of metrics. What? 
That's bigger or equal than zero? No. So the degree, the degree of uh, height is bigger than zero because L is ample. Then there is a notion of being arithmetically ample, which means then that the height of everything is strictly positive, but this guy will not be arithmetically ample, will only be arithmetically enough. So we only will know that the height is bigger or equal than zero, but this guy will never be arithmetically ample because we have in particular that the height of the tall variety is zero. Then the part B is that if I look at the absolute minimum, so this is the infimum of all possible heights of this L bundle, this is again zero. And in particular, this implies that the height of uh, with respect to L bar of any cycle Y will always be bigger or equal to zero. So it will be nef, but not strictly nef, will not be. Then the third part is that if the set y f start of y f square start of y and so on f start uh, k of y and so on if this set is finite then the height l bar of y is equal to zero so this is in some sense the analog of the fact that a root of unity has canonical height zero. And then the last part is that if I have a element X or Y maybe on X of Q bar, I have an element on uh, X of Q bar and it satisfies that uh, height of Y is equal to zero, then uh, the set Y, F of Y, F square of Y, and so on is finite, which means that the point is pre-periodic. So it does not need to be periodic, but it will be periodic here. Yeah. yeah uh, this I defined it yesterday. Uh, these were the different minima of the of the of the variety, and in some sense there are two important minima. That was the E B plus one is just the infimum for all of the height of X for all X inside X of Q bar. So it's the absolute minimum of the height. And the E one, that was the essential minimum, was the supremum respect to all set inside X, but not X, of the infimum of the height of the point X for all x inside x minus set of q bar. So this was the essential minimum. So the e1 is the minimal possible value of a generic point, and ed plus one was the minimal possible value of the height. And then I have that the absolute minimum is exactly equal to zero, which in particular will imply that all the heights are positive. And more questions? Okay, so let's see the proof. <coughs> No, the point is that the script L, you have to choose. You choose one. And then uh, what you do is you choose one that is, for instance, you can start choosing one that is relatively young. The problem is that with this process, I can only be sure that at each step I will get something that is relatively neat. Because you know the pullback of something ample is only semi ample. Then you know that it will be neat, but you don't know that it will be ample. So then in this process, what I know is that at some stage, maybe it will just only be. Uh, nef, so I cannot ask it to be ample everywhere. And the same will happen with the with the metric. Even as if I start with a metric which is strictly positive everywhere in the Archimedean part, maybe this process will give me a metric that is only semi-positive, that at some points it has curvature zero. So this I cannot control. I can only control that it will be nef, but not. Okay, so let's see the, the proof for this. <coughs> so in order to prove A, the trick is to use the prediction formula and it works uh, as follows. So I want to compute C1 hat of L bar to D plus one times F lower star of X. And I can do this in two ways. On one way, I can use the fact that uh, F is a map of degree N to the power D. Hence, F lower star of X is just X 
multiplied by n to the power d. So this is n to the power d, uh, c1 hat of L bar times x. On the other hand, the, this arithmetic uh, uh, <coughs> formula, so the, the, this arithmetic intersection product satisfies the prediction formula, which means that this is equal to c1 hat of f upper star of L bar d plus y times x. But now, what we know is that this guy is isomorphic to n times L bar to the power d plus one times x. And this implies that this is equal to n d plus one times c one hat of L bar times x. And since uh, we were assuming that n is bigger than one, we get that the only way that this equation can be true is that c one, okay, so this is the d plus one. The only possibility is that c one L bar of d plus one has to be equal to one. In some sense, the point is that this isomorphism is very good on the genetic fiber, but if we want to extend to a model, then the dimension is one more. And since the dimension is one more, then we'll have problems uh, if, we, if the extension of L is still ample on the whole, on the whole uh, object of dimension one more. And in particular, we get that the height, so now we use the formula for the height and we get that this is zero. The other, the second part, that uh, the height of f star of y is equal to n times the height of y. This is a similar computation, just using that the height respect to L bar of y, or if you want of f lower star of y, this is c1 hat of L bar. Now to the dimension of y plus one times f star of y divided by c1 of L to the dimension of y times y, and then the dimension of y plus one. Now, using the prediction formula here, we see that these uh, changes like n to the dimension of y plus one, while the ordinary degree just changes as n to the dimension of y. So it reminds us, so this is just n times c1 hat of L bar times y to the, d plus, uh, to the dimension of y plus one divided by c1 of L to the dimension of y times y, and then the dimension of y plus one. Uh, because this n comes from the fact that here, when I apply prediction formula, I will get n to the power dimension of y plus one, and when I apply prediction formula in this product, I will get n to the dimension of y. So I get this n. Okay. Now let's see part B. <clears throat> yes. So we have that the E D plus one of some Y of L bar. Yeah, sorry. Uh, this is what? This is the infimum for all X inside uh, X of Q bar of the height of L bar of X. Now, uh, the map in particular is subjective if it has higher degree at the level of X bar. So this is exactly the same as the infimum for all X inside X of Q bar of the height with respect to L bar of F of X. But now this is the same as the infimum for all X inside X of Q bar of N times the height of X. But this is just N times E of D plus one of L bar. Again, the only way we can get this equality is if ED is equal to zero. ED plus one is equal to zero. So the, the absolute minimum of the points on a variety is greater than zero. And now this, uh, this second part follows easily for this, for this minimum thing, because what we get is that the height of any cycle Y will always be bigger or equal than the absolute minimum of the points in Y. So this will be bigger or equal than the infimum for all points Y inside Y of Q bar of <coughs> uh, Y uh, of the height of Y. But of course, if I take the infimum for the points on Y, this will be bigger or equal than the infimum for all the Y's inside X of Q bar of the height of Y. 
and we know that this is zero. So we get that the height of any subvariety has to be bigger or equal than zero. Okay, now the third property that if this sequence is finite, then the height is zero. This is now clear because if I look at the heights of these elements, I get the height of y, n times the height of y, n squared times the height of y, n cubed times the height of y. If this set is finite, this means that the height has to be zero. And the last, the last uh, part, d, that if I have an element of height zero, then this set is finite. This is just using again Northcott property. So uh, the point is that uh, I discussed Northcott property and I tell you that in any predictive space, the Northcott property was true. But one can prove that for every continuous uh, norms, uh, for every continuous uh, metrics on, on an ample line bundle, the North Coast property is still true. So then I can apply the North Coast property of this, of this Adelic line bundle and then applying exactly the same method we use in the, in the proof of Kronecker theorem, we get this, this result. Okay. Okay. Is this clear? And in particular, as another corollary of this part, is that there exists only a finite number of preperiodic points in X of K for any number field. Also, again, the, the, the North Code property. So the, the number of preperiodic points or defined on a fixed field uh, is finite. That's by this. And in fact, this was the original motivation of Northcott when he was introducing his property. He was uh, really studying these kind of problems and trying to, to prove this kind of finiteness results. Okay. So this is then the, the basic about uh, uh, dynamical systems. And now uh, the first application of all these methods will be to a distribution. And then first I want to explain what is a distribution. And for this, I will make an, an experiment. So I will need the projector for five minutes, if this is possible. So the question is the following. If uh, you take a polynomial at random, can you say anything about the roots of this polynomial? Or the roots will be random. Uh, so then, in principle, one can imagine that one can say very little because I mean, taking a random polynomial, for instance, I take the roots are random, then I take x minus uh, lambda one times times x minus lambda n, and then any system of roots can appear in this random polynomial. So let's first uh, say so how I want to choose the random polynomial. Let's say that we take a polynomial and we fix, for instance, a bound. And I will ask that all coefficients are, for instance, between zero and five, and the distribution is uniform. And then I want to take polynomials of higher and higher degree. Can you say anything about the shape? So what will happen with the roots of a polynomial when I take higher degree? Let's make some experiments. Okay, so this is a program that computes so that chooses I tell him the, the degree and he will just choose a random a polynomial of this degree compute the roots and make a picture of the roots. I have chosen to make them integers because then I can use the theory of highs but if you take the integer away then there is other key results so I think it's Erdos Turan that always explain also what will happen. So I just take a random polynomial and let's see what happens. So if if the degree is three, well, I get, for instance, in this case, three roots. In this case, they are three real roots. Let's make a bigger polynomial, for instance, in degree, yeah, degree 13. Well, I get a bunch of points. Of course, since I am taking a polynomial with real coefficients, what I get is something which is symmetric with respect to, to the real index but we don't see very much now, it's just a bunch of points. Let's go to higher degree. Okay, 
quantum. Now, this uh, start not looking very random, these roots. Okay? So they uh, seems to be in a particular shape. If I go even to higher degree, let's put uh, degree 89. So you can see that they are even less random as before. And even I can predict where they will be. So I can just uh, take the picture of the circle, the unit circle, and you will see that the roots will be very close to the unit circle. And more or less, if you look at this segment, you will see the same roots uh, approximately as if you take this segment and so on. So the point is that there will be a few roots that are wherever, but most of the roots will be very close to the unit circle, and they will be equally distributed among the unit circle. And you can repeat this experiment as much as many times as you want, and you will always get this picture. Okay. No. No. No, 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 because so as long as I as I take a uniform distribution for all the coefficients, then you can always divide by the highest one and get something money. So the, it will not change even if you take money or not money, you will see this picture. So if you want to see a different picture, what you need to do is to uh, say, okay, now I will take, for instance, the combinatorial numbers, and I, I will choose the coefficient at random, but I will scale uh, each coefficient by a combinatorial number. So you need that the, that the points are exponentially different. And then you will get something different from this. But as long as they are more or less similar, uh, the, the distributions of each coefficient, you will get exactly the same. Whatever you take, a normal distribution, a constant distribution. So you really, if you want to get a shape different from this, you really need that the coefficients have to be very, very different. And one can make experiments. Uh, so <clears throat> doing these ideas, I can, but maybe not now, I can make an experiment where you take this random polynomial, chosen correctly, and the roots will converge to two circles or to n circles. I mean, you can, uh, but you have to predict what is the, the shape of the coefficients in some sense. You choose a random, but you scale one of the coefficients and other coefficients to get something like that. But if you take a random with the same distribution on each coefficient, you will always get this. Okay, that's done for the experiment. So it has been a success. So I will not need the, the screen anymore. Okay, so now the question is, how can we, so this that we have seen. So we have a bunch of points and suddenly these points seems to converge to certain shape. So how we can express the fact that a bunch of points converge to a shape. So the idea is to use measures. So let's start with a topological space. And let's take a bunch of points. So X a topological space. For instance, the one of these uh, Berkovich analytic spaces or a complex manifold. And now I have S inside X a finite set. Then uh, the point is that I don't have an old notion of convergence of finite sets. So I need to go to another space. So I will introduce a measure delta of S, that is a probability measure that is defined as one over the number of points in S, and then the sum of, uh, for all points in S, of the Dirac delta measure at the point P. So this means that if F is continuous, X to R is continuous, then the integral of F with respect to this measure, it will be just the sum for P inside S of one over the size of S times the value of the function at the point. So I have converted a finite set into a measure. Now I am in a space that has a nice linear properties that has a topology. So I can start studying the uh, conversions. And then if I have mu a probability measure, A 
probability measure in X, then I will say that delta of S converge to mu in what is called the weak star convergence. But let's say that delta S converges to mu. This is equivalent to us that for every F continuous, the limit when, uh, oh, sorry. So I have a priority measure. Then I have a sequence, Sn, a sequence of sets, of finite sets. Then I will say that the sequence of sets converts to this measure, so that the measure lambda is n converts to mu. This is equivalent that the, to us that for every continuous function, the limit when n goes to infinity of one over the number of points in Sn of the sum for all points in Sn of f of p has to be equal to the integral along x of f d of mu. Okay, and then I have a notion of what does it mean that a sequence of finite sets converges to a measure. And for instance, in the example we have seen, I can take the unit circle. In the unit circle, I can put the hard measure, which is the unique probability measure that is invariant under rotations. And in some sense, the experiment we have seen is that if I take polynomials of higher degree, then the set of roots in some sense converge to the hard measure of the unit circle. This will be a uh, result that explains what we have seen in the, in the experiment. Okay, <clears throat> now I need a, a little new ingredient also. So if I am in the case over C, B is the place at infinity. And then I am in X of C, and I have that the norm at infinity is smooth. Then everybody knows what is the first chain form of the line bundle with this metric to the power D, which was the dimension of the variety. So this will be a differential form. And if it is, uh, if the, metric is not only a smooth metric, but it's a semi-positive smooth metric or a strictly positive smooth metric. This will be a volume form on the whole of X. And then I can divide by the degree of L. And this will be a probability measure on the whole space. Okay. But we know how to do this for a smooth metrics. The point is that if I have a metric that is continuous and semi-positive, Then there is an existing analysis, a theory called Bedford-Taylor theory that allow me to make products of currents as long as they have some positivity properties. In particular, I can define again this object as a probability measure. So this C1 of L norm D is still well-defined. And we get a probability measure like this. Okay. <clears throat> but for this, it's important to have a semi-positive. So, because in some sense, the trick is to approximate any semi-positive metric by smooth ones and prove that the corresponding uh, volume forms will converge to some measure and take this measure as, as the finish of this. Now, if I have, a, <clears throat> this is a model metric, then to this model metric, Chamberlois has associated also a measure, C1 of L, this to the power. So uh, he didn't define what is the first chain forms. He only defined what is the top, uh, the product of them as a measure. So this is well defined in the case of a model metric and is defined using intersection theory on the model. But it turns out that this Bedford-Taylor uh, Bedford theory that allows me to construct this, this, uh, this uh, uh, form or this current in the case where the metric is semi-positive, can be also used in these Berkovich spaces. So there exist, so even in the case, in the admissible case, a C1 of L with this norm to the power D is well defined. Okay. So one can, this measure can be defined as long as we have positivity. 
either in the, in the non-Archimedean case as a limit of a smooth objects and in the non-Archimedean case as a limit of model metrics and communities. Okay, now I can uh, state the basic equidistribution result on this setting. <coughs> I will put the version of 2008 uh, and later, maybe tomorrow, I will put the, the most more modern version. So this was uh, the first version was Spiro, Ulmo and Sang. Then there is a version by Bilou. Then there is a version by Chamberlois, etc. There are many people working here. And then the version I will write is the version by Yuan in 2008. And this is as follows. So this is valid for number field. So let K be a number field. And I have uh, X over K, a projective variety. And L, an ample line bundle. on X and now <clears throat> assume that uh, L bar, which is just the pair L and a bunch of metrics is an admissible uh, line, metrical line bundle. So a limit of a smooth semi-positive metrics as I have explained. And now let Xn for N or Xi maybe for I bigger or equal than one, a sequence of points in X of K bar. So I take a sequence of algebraic points such that it satisfies two properties. The first property is that it is generic. And by generic, I mean that every subsequence is that is dense. I don't want that my sequence has a subsequence that is contained in a curve, for instance. So I want that my sequence are really uh, well, so C is what happens in the whole of this. And the second property is that it is small. A small means that the limit of the heights of the point has to be as small as possible. So I want that the limit when I goes to infinity of the height of the point Xi has to be the minimal possible. What is the minimal possible value? Well, uh, the point is that since my sequence is generic, at most it can go to the essential minimum. And the essential minimum, we know that it is bounded below by the height of the variety. So I will ask it that this limit is the height of X, okay? So this is a strong statement. And this means that for most metrics, I will not find any sequence satisfying these two conditions. But if I can find a sequence, that satisfies this condition that the limit of the height of the sequence is exactly the height of the variety, then the consequence is the following. If I look at the limit when I goes to infinity of this measure delta of the Galois orbit of the point xi, so for each point i, I look at the Galois orbit, all the conjugates, this will give me a finite set. Oh, maybe let's write for all 
places inside M of K, then I can see this as a measure on X B N. So because on uh, if I am on X C, I can make all the algebraic points inside X C. If I can choose another uh, place, I can insert the points in this uh, space, this, this Berkovich and Ike space. And since I am taking the Galois orbit, this will be independent on how you embed uh, KC on C. Then this guy is always equal to this probability measure, C1 of L B bar uh, to the D. This one that I have discussed that can be defined in the Archimedean or in the non Archimedean case divided by the degree of L. So always the points will equidistribute according to a measure that is given just by this differential form here. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So how time do I get? Maybe five minutes or Ouch. Okay, let's try uh, see if I can explain a little bit the proof. So the, the original proof by Spiro Ullman Sang of this theorem is using the what is called the <coughs> variational principle. So I will do the proof. Only in the following case, I assume that B is a place at infinity and that the norm at infinity, here I can do for any admissible one, I will do only in the case where this norm is a smooth and strictly positive. Which means a strictly positive, it means that C1 of L infinity and this norm infinity is not only a positive measure, but it has to be bigger or equal than epsilon times omega for some color form omega. So it has to be really positive everywhere. This will simplify a lot the results. And now I will suppose that this does not happen. So that this does not happen, this means that there exists a function f, continuous function, such that the uh, <coughs> limit when n goes to infinity of one over the number of points in the orbit of x uh, i goes to infinity of x i of f of x i, this is uh, u sub i, does not converge to the integral of f and then this c1, c1 of l b bar to the d over the degree. So I assume that this is not satisfied. This means that I can find a continuous function such that this limit is not this one. Now, what is clear is that after going to a subsequence, and this is why I really need this condition of genericity that is generic for every subsequence. After going to a subsequence, I can assume that this sequence converts to some guy, but it's not this one. So I can assume that this limit is equal to C, and this C is different from this integral of F B of mu, where mu is this measure here. Now, using the usual trick that I subtract to F this integral, I can assume that this integral is zero. And I can also changing F by minus F if needed, I can also assume that this constant is strictly negative. So this is just playing around with F. And I will assume also that the height of x, just for simplicity, that the height of x is equal to zero. Okay. So the, the sequence of points were converging to zero. Okay. So again, this is not an important thing. And now what happens? Now the key point is to study a, a small perturbation of my line bundle. <clears throat> for any lambda 
let's say lambda bigger than zero, I can consider the line bundle L bar, but with a small perturbation by F. This means that this is the same line bundle, the same metric B when B is different to infinity, but in the place I am interested in, the place infinity, I want that the, my metric is the original one, but multiplied by the function E to minus lambda. Okay, I just make a perturbation of the metric in the place of interest. Okay, the point is that if, if L, well, the first thing is that since I have made this a small perturbation, I can compute the height with respect to this L bar of F of lambda F using that I can compute the height using sections of the line bundle. It's very easy to see that this is just the previous height of the point X, but I have to add one over the number of points in the Galois orbit of X of the sum for all the points in this Galois orbit of this function F of X, and this is multiplied by lambda. So if I make this perturbation, it's very easy to find that the height of any point will be the original height plus this quantity. And you can see that this quantity is exactly the quantity I want to, to understand in this side. So it's this side of the, of the limit. It is given by this height of these points for this perturbed uh, matter. Now, the second point to observe is that if lambda is small, and I am assuming that the norm of infinity is strictly positive, this means that this L lambda F is still uh, positive or lambda small. Here I am using that the original one is strictly positive because if it were only semi-positive in the places where the curvature is flat, it might happen that then lambda F for very small lambda will turn, uh, will make things uh, of negative curvature. But if I know that F, that my original metric is strictly positive, I know that for a small lambdas, this will still be positive. Since this will be still positive, I will be able to apply all the machinery we have seen for positive things. And in particular, that we will have is that the limit when I goes to infinity of the height or with respect to this perturbed line bundle, L of F of XI, that thanks to this computation is just a lambda times the constant C. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, this sum is a sum of P in the orbit of X of F yes. of P. Yes, yes, yes. Of F of P. Or? F of P. Oh, sorry. Yes. So is this the sum of the points of the Galois orbit? <clears throat> And then, uh, so we have that this limit is this quantity, but now this has to be bigger or equal because this is a generic sequence. So this has to be bigger or equal than the essential minimum. And the essential minimum is bigger or equal than C1 hat of this L um, perturbed by lambda F bar to the D plus one times X divided by uh, the degree of L and the dimension of X plus one. Okay. So we have this inequality. This is the basic inequality between the essential minimum and the, the height of the variety. And now, <clears throat> can you see that in some sense, now the idea is that I want to now make the limit when lambda goes to zero, but if I make the limit when lambda goes to zero, of course, this will be zero, this, may, this will be zero, there is nothing to see. But if I divide by lambda, then the limit when lambda goes to zero of this part will be C. And the lambda, the limit when lambda goes to zero here is in some sense the derivative of the height in the direction of F. This is why this method is called the variational method because I am just computing the, the derivative of this quantity when I uh, perturb with F and let's see what it, so now, what is C1 hat 
of this L bar of lambda f to the d plus one times x. Now the point is that I can write down this perturbed uh, mantle as the original one plus the trivial one with the metric lambda f. So this is the trivial line bundle with norm of the section one equal to one, except at the place B where I put the metric given by F. And this was the original one. And now I can use that this guy is multilinear. Since this guy is multilinear, I get that C one hat of L bar of lambda F times e uh, to the power D plus one times X will be equal to the sum from k equal to zero up to d plus one of, and then I will have uh, the combinatorial number d plus one over k, and then I will have c one hat of lambda f to the power k, and c one hat of L bar to the power D plus one minus K and then times six. So the, the intersection product is multilinear. So I have a product like this. And now I can look at the lower degree terms. So the lower degree terms will be the case when K is equal to zero. When K is equal to zero, I have C one of L bar to D plus one K times X. Remember that I was assuming that the height of uh, x is zero. The fact that the height of x is zero means that the term, the <coughs> uh, independent term, the term that has no lambda is zero. Now, what happens with the term with lambda equals to one? So the term with uh, C1 of lambda f. Yeah. So the term C1 hat L bar, uh, sorry, lambda f times uh, C one hat of L bar to D. This is the next term. One can compute this easily, and this turns out to be the integral along X C of the of lambda times the function F times C one of L bar, the power D. This can also be computed easily, but remember that I was assuming that my function F satisfies that this integral is zero. So this term is just O of lambda squared. Because uh, with the assumption of F, I have made that the main term and the first degree term is zero. So this term is lambda squared. This means that this quantity can be differentiated, it has a derivative and the derivative is zero. Now I can divide by lambda, take the limit when everything goes to zero, and I get that C is bigger or equal to zero. But remember that I have been able to obtain, the, to assume that C was strictly smaller than C. So I get a contradiction. So I get that the limit has to be uh, this limit here. Okay. So as you see, so this was the original uh, the proof by Spiro, Ullman, Sang, but it really is a particular one because you need to be in an Archimedean place and you need that your metric in this Archimedean place is smooth and you need that the, it is strictly positive. But for instance, it will be enough to apply to the case of abelian varieties. But uh, on the other hand, the theorem by Yuan of 2008, this is valid for any number field and any admissible metric. And you get the same result for all places. And the later result that I will explain tomorrow, uh, it's valid even for function fields or arbitrary characteristics, so it's a much more general result. It needs other techniques. Okay, I will stop here. <coughs> Yes. <clears throat> so the point is that let's compute. Mm. I forgot to say that I start with a continuous function, but approximating f by smooth functions, I can still assume that f was smooth. So I forgot to say this part. Now let's compute C1 of. L 
with this norm times e to minus lambda f. Okay. So what is this guy? This guy, I have to choose a section, and this will be the log of the, uh, so it's DDC of the log of the norm of a section, I think with a minus sign here, minus DDC of the log of, uh, of this section, the norm prime. And then this is what? This is minus DDC of the log of the norm S. And then I have uh, minus the log of this. This will be plus lambda DDC of F. Okay. But now <clears throat> this is equal to omega plus lambda DDC of F. Then this guy is a one one form and a smooth one one form. So in particular, the coefficients will be bounded. This is a one one form that is strictly positive. And then I know that if I add, if I make lambda small enough, this will still, still be strictly positive. But this is why I really need that omega is strictly positive because if omega were zero at some places, then this guy will make it negative. Any further questions? Okay. If not, let's thank the speaker.